It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. I want to spend a little time talking a little about history. You know, the the fact uh, that we don't spend enough time remembering where we've come from. And, you know, February 12th, 1968, an extraordinarily important day, an extraordinarily significant day in the civil rights movement in this country. As you saw some 1,300 black sanitation workers take to the picket line in Memphis, Tennessee, battling you know, horrible wages, deplorable working conditions, discrimination on the job, you name it. Uh, now, these workers in No Rights at Work, Tennessee, uh, they were members of AFSME, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 1733. And, and look, you know, following the death of two of their fellow workers, Eccle Coles and Robert Walker, they said, this is enough. Uh, we've been complaining about the, the, the horrible conditions. We've been complaining about what's going on and on deaf ears. And the strike gathered national attention and national support because it did. It, it highlighted the ongoing economic and racial injustices that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was, was talking about and what the, the civil rights movement was fighting for. This is the kind of history that our children need to learn. And, you know, back in 2013 and 2015, when, when we took the little show on the road, I took my kids on the road to learn actual history. This was a central issue in, in both of our tours, our 2013 Labor History Tour and our 2015 Civil Rights Tour. This is one of those moments, the fight for dignity in the workplace, the fight for economic justice, for, well, a piece of that American dream. And understand the significance of, of what happened on February 12th, 1968. And not just understand but understand why it was allowed to happen understand what came came out of it and well through the struggles moving forward because understand you know while dr king gave his famous speech you know days after this strike began um the dream for far too many not not realized and you know we, we know that this strike was brought on because look horrible working conditions uh, sanitation workers in Memphis, primarily black workers, faced extraordinarily hazardous working conditions. As someone who worked on the back of a, of a garbage truck uh, for a, a couple of years going through college, this is not an easy job. It was a dirty, nasty job. It was a hard job. And to have the kind of, well, broken down junk equipment that eventually caused the deaths of Eccle Cole and Robert Walker, um, you finally had people saying, that's it. That was the catalyst for the strike that, that happened and that moved a country. But even more than just the bad working conditions, the poverty wages, you had you know massive discrimination. Uh, striking workers were protesting at the time against uh, discriminatory, discriminatory treatment in pay, uh, lack of benefits, uh, racial segregation in the workplace, all of those things that we now... Well, my kids, at least, take as, well, that's that's 100 years ago. But this is actually in someone's lifetime. And, you know, the, the reality is, and, and, and I talk about this quite often, if we are going to unite the country, if we're going to foster equality, if we're going to foster justice, both in, in society and economically, it's going to be through our unions. It's going to be through through bringing people together and collectively bargaining and giving people collective bargaining rights. Because understand, you know, when these workers were, were striking, um, you know, and, and AFSCME Local 1733 provided them with the, the bargaining power and representation to fight for those better hours, and hours wages, and conditions, um, the law is still not on their side. Now, the reason the strike... I, I, we can argue all of the hows and the whys, but the reason that the strike eventually was settled is 
you know, this is what led to the assassination of, of Dr. King. Dr. King gave his, you know, his famous uh, speech in, on April 3rd and on April 4th, uh, 1968, he was, he was murdered. Uh, April 16th, there's a settlement, there are reforms. Uh, the union in, in the city of Memphis, who had been, you know, horribly opposed, uh, came to an agreement, ended the strike. You had wage increases, improved conditions. They had union recognition. And oddly enough, one of the few places in the entire, entire state of Tennessee that got union rec recognition at the time. And you go, you know, the lasting impact that came out of this is you had these sanitation workers and this strike had lasting impact on labor rights and civil rights. It inspired continued activism and, and contributed to the passage of the 1968 Civil Rights Act that provided some, some protections against discrimination, expanded civil rights lawsuits. So for me, this, this bit of history, this moment that I don't know that we spend enough time talking about, uh, our children don't quite learn about, because I had you know the moment to, to sit down with my kids recently and go, have you guys learned, other than our tours, other than us going, did you learn about this specifically? And while they learned about Dr. King's assassination, they weren't put together. And the reality is all this stuff walks hand in hand. And, and you go, well, why, why are you talking about this now? Well, obviously the anniversary, but we're in a moment where there are some in our society who want to deny history. There are some who want to silence history. We can't teach certain history. And as I've said, you know, back in 2015, we, we did our civil rights tour because of, you know, my kid, my, my oldest daughter came home and you, know, you had that conversation. You know, what'd you learn in school today? And she came home one day and said, oh, I learned about Rosa Parks. I go, well, what'd you learn? Figuring she was going to share some, some bits of knowledge. Oh, she was tired. And that's it. Now, look, it could have been just a, uh, you know, a, a kid gone. I don't want to talk about this. I forgot. I didn't write it down. Could have been all of that. But that wasn't a sufficient answer. And what we did as part of doing what I do on this little program is we decided we we're going to take a month long tour. And we were going to go throughout the southern U.S. to every place we could find that people would talk to us where we treated black people terribly in this country. We went to their their tourist traps because, you know, it seems uh, places that were really bad have decided that tourism dollars are possible. And we went to a lot of really, really, I hate to say good, I hate to use the, that word. We went to some comprehensive uh, museums and institutes and and. And facilities that that have warehoused and documented how horrible we treated people in this country. So the information is there, the knowledge is there. We just have to want it. And what's remarkable to me is there are some who want to take us backwards. So in this moment of of the, this historical, this historical date and the historic and the history that it was. I, I wanted to throw it out there. So when we, we come back, I'm going to talk with AFSCME President Lee Saunders about this anniversary and what it means for working people today uh, and what this anniversary should mean and how we should be go about remembering this this historic moment. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. Quick break. Right back with AFSCME President Lee Saunders. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So the 1968 Memphis sanitation strike, a pivotal moment in American civil rights history and for the civil rights movement. And it was triggered by the deaths of two 
black sanitation workers, Eckel Cole and Robert Walker. Uh, unsafe working conditions. Look, as someone who's worked on the back of a packer and, and understands you're trying to get out of the rain, the kind of power these machines have and the horrific death that this must have been, uh, no wonder it led to a historic strike and the uh, iconic I am a man slogan symbolizing, symbolizing dignity and equality. And it was 56 years ago today that those 1,300 sanitation workers took to the picket line in Memphis demanding union representation in the union that was out there fighting for them. Our good friends at AFSCME, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. And here to share some thoughts on, well, this this anniversary and, well, what's come after. I've asked Lee Saunders to come talk with us. Lee is the president of AFSCME. Uh, Lee, thanks for taking time for us. Glad to be here. Good, good seeing you again, Rick. Uh, I appreciate you taking your time, especially on this day. I mean, this iconic day. Um, of, of of solidarity, this day of of people standing up for themselves, and and look that iconic moment, uh, that I am a man, uh, that that image that has stuck with me all these years, especially as someone who's worked on the back of a garbage truck. Well, I, I tell you, it's something that we have to remind uh, not only our friends in labor but the entire country uh, about what happened what happened in 1967, what happened in 1968, uh, what happened to those sanitation workers who stood up finally and said that enough was enough. Uh, they were tired of uh, being abused. They were tired of being mistreated and they wanted to be treated like men. And they went on strike. Uh, they went on strike uh, on February 12th. And that's saying something back then in 1968, 1300 African-American sanitation workers challenging the powers of the city of Memphis, Tennessee, saying that they had enough and that they were going to make their voices heard loud and clear. Well, there's a certain point, and I, I talk about this quite often, there's a certain point where you just have to have enough. And the fact that these workers were killed, uh, the fact that injuries were, as I understand, were, were commonplace, uh, that this was a tough, dirty, dangerous job, low pay, uh, long hours, desperation. You, you kind of, there, there kind of is no other, no other place to go, right? Well, yeah, but just remember the environment that existed back then, especially for, for African Americans in a Southern city uh, where they were, that was commonplace to be quite honest with you. Uh, and these workers were uh, providing essential, important services to the city of Memphis, see, picking up the trash, picking up the gar garbage every single day, working under strenuous conditions, working under dangerous positions. Those two workers were crushed in the back of a sanitation truck because they were trying to get out of the bad weather. And they went into the back of the truck to, to seek refuge, and the and the truck ma malfunctioned, and it ended up crushing them. This problem had been relayed to management time after time after time again, and management was refusing to deal with it because they didn't care. They didn't care about these African-American workers. All they wanted to know was that if the trash was being picked up, regardless of the conditions that workers uh, were experiencing every single day. Yeah. So, I mean, this was an historic moment back then for those workers to say, we've had it, we've had it, we aren't going to take it anymore, and we're going to withhold our labor. Now, this is the kind of history that I think is important for us, that should be taught more in school. Uh, I didn't learn about it until I was out of high school, and actually working on the back of a garbage truck, uh, where, so, where the anniversary had come up and someone had said, hey, you know, can you imagine being crushed in the back of this packer? And, and that's when I learned about it. It wasn't in school. And this is where, you know, when we did you know, a labor history tour back in 2013, Memphis was one of the stops to talk about this strike in particular, because uh, I think understanding where we've come from maybe might help us not return there. We can't let people forget. Uh, we can't let people forget what was sacrificed, uh, what was fought for, and what we continue to have to fight for. You mentioned something that's very interesting to me. Rick, uh, when you said that uh, uh, that you didn't read about it when you were in school. Yet today, in this environment, we have governors all across the country trying to take those kinds of lessons and those kinds of textbooks dealing with these kinds of issues out of the school system, saying that it's not appropriate to teach. And we've, we've got to make sure that the struggle, and we understand this, that the struggle still continues, that these workers did not, did not fight 
for nothing. They fought to improve their work lives every single day, but it was also sending a message to Memphis and to the enti entire country that things had to change. And we've still got a similar message that we've got to deliver in 2024, well, where our freedoms are, are being taken away from us, where workers still face the same kinds of issues and problems at the work site, where if someone wants to belong to a union, the corporations and sometimes the governments do everything possible to take that right away from them. And so, you know, we've come a long way since 1968, but in a certain way, we've still got a lot to fight for. And we can never forget, and we've got to connect our history, what happened then to what is going on now, and, 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 and to instill within our members, but also to instill within young people the importance of standing up and making your voice heard and fight, fight for what you believe in. And if you look at the statistics right now, where workers believe that unions are absolutely necessary, the American public believes that unions are necessary. 67% of the American public believes that. But you know what, just as important, or more importantly, 88% of young people believe that unions are absolutely necessary. And they want to have an opportunity to be a part of a union. And that's why you see so much organizing going on across the country today. And that's why these stories, the remembering this history is so important. Uh, because you, you look to the past for what potentially could happen in the future. And look, you bring up young people. Uh, the fact is they've been watching their parents being ground down to nubs and, and working in desperate conditions and, and struggling to make ends meet. And they don't want that to be their future. And that's the right message. That's what we should be taking from history, uh, learning the lessons and then making things better, not trying to, not, not trying to rewrite history, not trying to quash it, uh, but taking the, the right message and moving forward. That, that's exactly right. And it is so important for us to be successful in doing that. And you said this earlier, we've got to understand where we came from. We've got to understand the struggles of those workers in the past who fought and stood up for what they believed in. And we've got to remind ourselves and our citizens across the country that these fights contributed to having a stronger economy and a stronger movement because people were willing to stand up and say enough is enough. And that's what we tried to do with the podcast, yeah. uh, where we recreated the struggles in 1968. We talked about the strike. We actually interviewed uh, sanitation workers who were part of that strike. We actually interviewed someone who is still working on the truck, who's 80 years old. And he's still driving that truck to talk about what that experience was like. And we wanted to recreate that moment through these podcasts. And hopefully your readers and your listeners will, will, will pick up that podcast and listen to these workers. We had Jim Lawson, who was instrumental in the clergy uh, to support the striking workers. We had Bill Lucy, Secretary Treasurer Emeritus of AFSCME. We had so many folks talking about the issues that confronted these workers, including the workers themselves and their family members, uh, to educate and to continue to, uh, to uplift uh, people who are concerned about the welfare of working people right now, to say that anything is possible if you set your mind to it and you fight for it every single day. Yeah, and it's an excellent series, and I hope folks will take a look at it. It's the I Am Story podcast at imstory.com. Uh, we'll get links out on social media how folks can take a look at that because I think this is you, this is important because it's not it's a, it's about all of the entire the the entire time period and the things that went into it because we, we think back to this and you know you know Dr. King is uh, you know you know front and center and all this in fact was in Memphis for this strike when he was assassinated that seems to be the thing that in in my mind uh, overshadows everything else. But it was the, the courage of these of these workers that history will probably not know their names. Uh, it's the history of, of these 1,300 men, men and their families who fought uh, for, for decency and for dignity that history is going to forget. And I, I hope we don't allow that to happen. We can't allow that to happen. And, and let's be honest, Dr. King would have never been in Memphis if it wasn't for those workers standing up for themselves. I was with uh, Martin Luther King III, Martin King III, uh, on uh, on the King holiday, and we were together, and we were talking about the importance of that strike, but the, the fact that we've still got 
so many things that we've got to, to, to accomplish. Uh, so many things that we have, have to continue to fight for. Right. So many things that are, people are trying to take away from us. So we've got to make that, that kind of connection so people get it. Uh, and all of us have a responsibility to do that. We're living in some very trying times right now. I don't have to tell you that. No. But and there's scary times as well. Absolutely. But here's to, the thing. We're, we're in a political moment. And mobilize and educate our people about that. We are in a political moment where, you know, in my view, you've got Joe Biden, who, you know, in my view, the most pro-union president of my lifetime. Uh, Donald Trump, the most anti-union president of my lifetime. Uh, the guy who, you know, Trump, the guy who appointed Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court that made our nation a no rights at work country for for public sector workers and and i i believe pushing us back towards the days of 1968 where public sector workers didn't have the right to organize didn't have the right to collectively bargain and and i see you know right in front of us uh that history playing out sadly well we have a responsibility all of us and you do a great job at uh, talking about the issues that confront working families but all of us have a responsibility uh, to not shy away from these conversations. And some of these conversations, when you're talking to members about the importance of involving yourself in politics, the importance of voting, you know, those can be difficult conversations sometimes because some folks say it doesn't make any difference. Well, it does. It does. Now, one thing that I will always tell the members of AFSCME when I'm talking to them in small meetings or conventions across the country, I will never tell you how to vote. That's a personal decision that you must make. But I am going to try my best to educate you on who's the best to vote for and who stands up for working folks across this country and what they have done to support working people. And then you make that choice. And I think there's a clear, clear picture that's in front of us as far as who has stood up for working families and who's not standing up for working families. And that's what we've got to do. We cannot be discouraged. We've got to talk about this with our members. We've got to listen to what they have to say, but we've got to educate them about the differences that exist with politicians who want to support working families and those who want to take us back to 1968. And the kind of desperation and, and, unsafe working conditions and, and all of that, that that those men suffered and struggled under. So, you know, in, in on this anniversary, what's the message for, for the working people today? You know, what, what are you hoping people take from this? I mean, the podcast, fantastic. And again, I hope po folks will go to imstory.com and check out the I Am Story podcast. But what are you hoping people take from from this this anniversary? What are you hoping people are doing today as, as today passes? Well, I, I, I think that the struggle continues and you can see that and you can feel it across the country with with folks wanting to organize into unions, young people being excited about union, what unions have to offer and wanting to organize. And we've just got to carry that momentum forward. And then we've got to reward our friends who are trying to help us organize workers and have a fair economy that has health care and child care good infrastructure, money going to state and local governments. We've got to support those politicians who believe in that. And then we have got to turn our backs on those politicians that might talk a good game, but they have no record in supporting those issues that I just outlined to you. And we've got to be smart about this. And our members are smart about it. But sometimes you just got to break it down. Or in a you got a kind of way. Or you got to look at their, their actual records. Uh, yeah. So, you know, the mission's not complete, clearly. Uh, we people don't have good wages, don't have uh, health security, don't have retirement security, especially in, in, in a number of southern states, especially in states that are no rights at work states. Um, you know, what is the marching order coming out of today? What are you hoping people will what actions do you think ho want people to take uh, with this information on remembering this history? What's what's the action? What's the move forward? Continue to fight, continue to organize, continue to mobilize continue to educate our communities across the country, participate in the political process by electing our friends and punishing our enemies, and continue to move forward and not get discouraged, just as those sanitation workers in 1968 didn't get discouraged. If they didn't get discouraged, we can't get discouraged, and we've got to continue to move forward. I am story dot com the website for the i am story podcast lee saunders i appreciate you taking time for us on this anniversary thanks so much thank you rick good seeing you again you as well 
I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Make sure you check out this podcast. Um, well worth the, the, the episodes. Uh, I loved it. Uh, I am story.com. Back after this. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So the podcast, I am story.com, highly, highly suggest it. Uh, well worth the listen. And look, historical, uh, accurate, and the kind of things uh, we should be teaching our children. And look, you know, the most impactful aspect of the 1968 sanitation strike was the powerful symbolism that was embodied by the workers' adaptation of the slogan, I am a man, uh, encapsulated, you know, just the basic, the basic, you know, basic human dignity, the demand for, for respect, the demand for, for equality, uh, the demand for decency, uh, not just in the workplace, but beyond. Uh, the, this idea that life matters. And, and for me, this is one of those moments where the, you know, I can't emphasize enough how important this moment in history was. So again, I hope folks will check out the website. I am story.com. Uh, most certainly well worth the, the checking out the podcast. In fact, you know, I, I, I listened to it twice. Uh, it is that well done, uh, but I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, can we, as a country, can we embrace our past? Can we look at actual history and go, Hey, uh, we did some bad things. We did some terrible things. And then say, we won't, we're not going to do it again. And this is my problem with the argument from the right. By acknowledging that bad things were done, I, I, I think they believe that we're blaming them for it. And, and, and maybe we are if they want to continue these practices. Uh, but for me, this is, uh, this is one of those moments where uh, the hope, the hope is that we learn from history. That we embrace it and we don't we don't allow it to continue because if we can pull people together if we can bring all of us together maybe we can have basic dignity for everybody i know crazy for our free speech tv audience thanks so much for tuning in we'll see you back here next time for our radio affiliates across the country quick break right back Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I got to tell you, you know, it's it's quite remarkable to me where we are as a country when you look at the fact that they're actually doing polling on what people believe about Taylor Swift in our political realm. Uh, they're actually doing polling and a reputable polling outfit. Uh, Mammoth University, a reputable Reputable poll. Uh, they polled on the... <laughs> Do people believe there's a conspiracy uh, with the government and the CIA, a covert government effort for Taylor Swift to help Joe Biden get reelected? They actually polled on this. And the numbers, I gotta, I gotta tell you, numbers not surprising. Not surprising to me at all. In fact, I'm, I'm actually surprised that only 18% of the people that they polled. And I got to question the polling results that only 18% say that they believe that there's actually a covert government effort, a Rube Goldberg intricate scheme to get Joe Biden elected that has a pop star and a football player and a Super Bowl, all these things that they dreamt up you know, months and months and months ago. Argue years ago, because in order to get Taylor Swift where she is and Kelsey where he is and the Chiefs and... This is, wow, it's a lot. But according to the poll, 18% believe that there is a scheme. There's a plot. 
Now, fortunately, 73% don't believe it or, you know, they're the ones who are going, no, I don't, I don't believe it. No. Uh, 9% don't know. And that's the curious one. You go, um, I don't know. Could be, you know, could be anything. Those are generally your, uh, the 18 and the nine, those 27%, those are generally your Fox viewers, generally your right wing echo chamber folks. And this really is the power of media. It's the power of right-wing media dominance in this country that you have 27% of the people either believing that there is this intricate scheme that has happened or they're, they're not quite sure, don't, don't really know. Now, according to the polling numbers, 71% of those who believe uh, they identify or lean toward the Republican Party. 83% of them say they're going to vote for Donald Trump in the fall. Now, you go, well, that's only 70, only 71% of Republicans. Yeah, the other ones are even further to the extreme. They're the libertarian, you know, the anarchist types. Uh, they're, the re they're, they're solidly the 18%. 73%, uh, they believe that the... Uh, the the thing was fraudulent. The whole thing was made up, and 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 good fun. I'm in that. I'm in that that category. Uh, I believe. Yeah, good. This is for the dim. Um, on on a, on a different note, though, and as they point out, a less sinister note. Sixty eight percent of the country say that you know, they approve of Taylor Swift encouraging fans to vote in the upcoming election. And I got to tell you, sixty eight percent may go, hey, that's a good number in this day and age. Um, I'm surprised. It should be 100%. You know, we want everyone to vote. We want people to exercise their right to the franchise in this wonderful experiment of self-rule. But even that, even that is divisive and tearing us apart. Uh, and, and look, I've gotten so many conspiracy theories thrown at me on, you know, who's doing what and why. Uh, my favorite, I still think, is that this is all the devil uh, evidently, there's some televangelist somewhere in, in the South who, you know, it's, it's Satan pulling the strings, the puppeteering, because the Democrats are demoncrats and they're evil. And, um, you know, I guess I grew up at a time where religion was supposed to bring out the best in us, make us better, make us want to be better people, a little more honest, a little more faithful, a little, little more decent to our neighbors. Uh, evidently, uh, evidently not. And the reason I bring this up again is because I think it's important. We're focusing on all the wrong things. Uh, we're being force-fed a steady diet of outrage and division. Uh, and look, it, it's it's what you know their all algorithms is what the, the the social media folks, it's what the political folks, it's what the algorithms and the ca the cable echo chamber want us to be talking about. It's what they want because what they don't want us to be focusing on are real problems. Because if we did focus on those real problems, on the things that are making our lives a little more difficult than they should be, are making our ability to make ends meet a little more difficult than they should be, um, they know that we would, we would find out pretty quick that it's them that's the problem. Not the guy next door. Uh, not the person across the street. Not the person who looks a little different. Them. The moneyed interest who keeps shoving this stuff down our throats. This ridiculous, idiotic nonsense. The fact that Mammoth did a poll on whether people actually believed that there was a conspiracy by government to put Taylor Swift front and center to get Joe Biden is ludicrous. It's mind-numbingly stupid, but it's where they've got us. Because we're the generation of American Idol and Cheetos. We're the, we're the generation of, of it's got to be in a neat little bag, very simple to digest, and, well, crazy. Because, again, if we talk about real problems, we're going to want real solutions. And in those places where there are real problems, well, I know my Republican friends have no solutions. Because they don't want to solve any of these problems because it's better to keep us at each other's throats. Because the status quo, the status quo is what the wealth class of this country wants. They've got the country right where, it, right where they want it. Everything is working perfectly. For those people who go, but, but Rick, you know, everything's broken. No, no, everything's working just great. 
for the people that it's working just great for. Now, if you're struggling, you're sadly, well, not, not in charge. Or they don't care about you. And this is where every person who's complaining about inflation and low wages and struggling to make ends meet should be organizing together and, and putting aside all this, this ridiculousness. But we can't. And I go back to, to the, the Jay Gould quote. Uh, railroad magnate Jay Gould is credited with saying, I could pay half the working class to murder the other half. Because it's easy to divide us. It's easy to pit us against each other. A perfect example of that. I've been paying attention to some of these, uh, you know, the TikToks and the, the reels and the shorts and these these videos of of Gen Z workers basically having meltdowns on the job. Uh, and it goes something like this, you know, Gen Z workers at their wits end. Uh, they're, they're struggling. They, they're still living in mom's basement or living with roommates or not able to pay their bills. And life is not life is not what they were told it was going to be. It is not the bowl of cherries that they thought it was going to be. And they're busting their behind just to fall behind. And they're doing what they've been told as a generation. See something, say something. Talk about your feelings. Bring that out. Don't, don't stay silent. Don't let it bottle up. Whereas my generation, if, if someone in my generation, especially a man, were to come out and talk about their feelings, they'd be mocked incessantly. And that'd be our parents doing that. You know, my mother was very clear. A man never cries. A man never shows emotion. A man just gets up and does what he's supposed to do. You do your job. You, 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 you hammer away. You don't, you don't show fear. You don't show anger. You don't show frustration. You don't show, you certainly don't cry. We've decided as a country that that's probably not good. And we raised a generation of kids to be a little bit more in touch with their feelings, a little bit more forthcoming. Uh, we told them, hey, don't take care of problems yourself. Go, go tell someone. So they're doing what this generation is doing, what they were, what they were raised to do. And that is express themselves. So uh, am I surprised that, that Gen X commentators on these social media platforms who are just looking for attention themselves are mocking these kids? No. Am I surprised that you've got the millennials who go, hey, well, they're, they're, at least they're not mocking us. Mocking them? No. It's easy to mock these kids. It really is. But I'll tell you, as I listen to a number of them, they've all got the same complaints. I'm, I'm doing what I was, I'm told I'm supposed to do. I'm working 40 hours a week. I'm busting my behind. I'm doing the job and I can't, I can't make ends meet no matter what I do. And one, one young woman hit, it, hit the nail on the head. I don't even think she knew she did it. She said, look, you call us lazy. You say that we don't want to you know, do anything. And yet, you know, we're out here trying in a system that we didn't build, in a system we had no part of breaking, but you want us to fix it. And this is, this is the, the amazing part because she's right. Baby boomers screwed this country up badly because they wanted more. We wanted lower taxes so we could slash and burn city budgets and, and school district budgets so we could have more. And we voted for these conservatives who slashed and burned our government down to virtually nothing because, hey, we should be able to take that, that government and drag it in the bathtub. We want it so small we can drown it. They're the ones who took the, the knives, the Ginsu knives to the social safety net and slashed it to tatters. And the only one that there is a social safety net for are the big welfare queen corporations, not the actual working people. And this is where, you know, all of these commentators looking for their clicks and their views and their attention and oh, how clever they are to attack these young people. What they seem to forget is this generation, they've been told that they can change the world. And what I believe is, and we're seeing it, that there's a lot of labor activity going on. And these kids are entering a workplace that, she's right, they didn't build. They didn't allow it to get this bad. They didn't allow poverty wages to exist for decades. They didn't allow the kind of horrible treatment in the workplace that their parents' and grandparents' generation allowed and encouraged in a lot of points. 
And I heard of people, oh, well, you know, it was tough when I was younger and you know, I had to do this. Shut up. Nothing like these kids are going through right now. You had opportunities. You had the chance of buying a home at some point. You had the opportunity to get a good union job. And I talk about this often. I think about the kid growing up in the housing project where I grew up and wondering what chance that kid's got to lead at least the, the, the kind of life that I was able to lead and to get out of poverty at least on the pathway that I did. And that is working, you know, 70 hours a week, busting your behind to try and make ends meet and, and doing the things that we all we all have to do. And this generation understands that, too. But they just don't see the reward at the end. So for me, when I look at this, I go, you know, this person's right. How do you fix that? And it's what I've been talking about for almost 20 years of doing this little program. We begin by organizing the workplaces. We begin by taking that worker and taking that person's concerns to heart. Because understand, we heavily fund socialist programs for corporate America. We've got socialism for corporations. Walmart, one of the biggest welfare queens on the planet. Uh, I probably pay high, I, I haven't shopped in a Walmart in 25 years, but I'm still paying taxes to Walmart so that they can, their employees can get some bit of, of health care, some bit of, of economic security. Now, my commentator friends on the right will go, well, that's why we need to destroy those programs. I'm like, no, no, that's, that's the wrong message. Again, the wrong focus, the corporate focus, the wealth class focus, the focus that we should be on. How do we get Walmart to pay the workers what they earn? See, that's the important part here. I'm not going to use the deserve word because nobody deserves anything. It's what did you earn? And these workers showing up, working 40 hours a week, doing what society tells them that they have to do to be an adult. They should be able to be, be able to make ends meet. Now, there are a lot of questions with that. What does that mean? Should they be able to buy a mansion? No, of course not. But you should be able to get a one-bedroom apartment with a, you know, a jalopy of a car and put food on the table and not have to worry about being bankrupt at the end of the week or begging government for a handout. Yeah, we all had it tough. We all worked hard when we were younger. We all when you got, leapt over the obstacles that were in front of us. But not like this generation. And this is where instead of mocking them, Instead of going after them and, and criticizing them for being lazy or, or stupid or whatever it is that these, these idiots are throwing out there, why don't we help them? Why don't we guide them like the old timer did for me when I first start, when I started my first union job? Now, here I was, what, 19, 20 years old? Guy in his 60s came over, put his arm around me, said, kid, we're going to make a teamster out of you yet. And he gave me some solid advice and was there if I had questions, was there if I needed something. And you know what? My union was there too. So if we want to engage these young people, we do it by taking them under our wing and helping them, not mocking them, not tearing them apart. And then politically, we pursue an agenda that's going to, oh, I don't know, make lives better. And again, I come back to the politics of this. The politics of this are very clear. The moneyed interest want the status quo. They want us pitted against each other. Like I said, Jay Gould, half the working class versus the other or half of the working class eating each other so that the 1% can walk away with all of the, the spoils. That's how the game's been played. There's nothing new here. Everyone agrees on that. Schmucker Carlson agrees that that's how the game is played. And yet he's a big part of, of, of creating that division. So this comes back down to you and me. It comes to us looking at that kid and going, hey, you know, we're going to help. We're going to make sure that you have a chance at life, an opportunity to do better. And we're going to do that through policy because we can't do it individually. I'm a big believer in, uh, I'm as much of an individualist as anyone else, but I'm a big believer in government doing the things uh, that we can't do individually that we do it collectively through our government. And one of those things is ensuring that there's a there's a safety net under people's feet. Raise the minimum wage sounds like a, a pretty good start. 
uh, considering it's still $7.25 an hour from, what, 14 years ago? We can double that immediately. But more importantly, we can push policies to encourage people to be able to bargain for the wealth that their labor creates, that they earn. Again, I love the meritocracy frame. You go, you do your work. I am, I'm, all in, I'm all in line with if you want to you eat, you got to work. I'm right there. Everyone should work. But you should be compensated at a level that you can, you can support yourself. There's no question about that. And understand, we used to have this. You know, you go back to the baby boomer era. You could, yes, you could, on a retail salary, support a family. Now, you didn't live high off the hog in luxury. You didn't have a swimming pool and all that stuff. But you were able to put a roof over the head. You were able to save and, and, and put kids through college. You were able to do a lot of things. Why? Well, <laughs> because we had a sane, rational, reasonable tax code that said, hey, we're going to help working people. And you rich folks, you're, you're going to still be rich, but you're not going to be as rich. And I look at this story that Warren Buffett was in the other day. Uh, you know, Buffett came out and said, you know, understand that financial inequality isn't a diabolical plot. I kind of disagree, but he said, not a diabolical plot. No, it's just, how do you put it? It's just, well, the result of, of a capitalist system. It's the result of, of, of how our system accumulates wealth into the hands of a very few um, it's not deliberately done. It's a market system design, and it's something we we could do. Uh, he believes that you know the system promotes efficiency and growth, and and you know just you know oops, we've left some people behind. Now that's his argument. I fundamentally disagree with it, but I, I like the fact that he realizes that there is a problem, and this is the important part. Focus on here's the problem. We have a massive distribution of wealth problem have had it for a very long time, decades in fact. And it's all because of this tax cut fetish that we've been we've been afflicted with. And we can get over this because Buffett himself, one of the richest men on the planet, says that we need to raise taxes on the very wealthy. Wow. I, I've been saying that for oh, 30 years. And he also says we need to raise the earned income tax credit so that working families can get a hand. Get a hand up. All in favor. Both things that we've talked about in this program for years. Both things that would do enormously positive things for the working class of this country. Which is why it's not going to happen. Because you, you think about what I just said a moment ago. Warren Buffett says that it's not a diabolical plot. It's just, it's just a system. But here's the, here's the solution. Now, in right-wing spaces, in the media culture, what we're to focus on is, is it a diabolical plot or is it not? And that's where we spend all of our energy, not on the solution, because they don't want the solution. They want us fighting over things. And I don't care whether Buffett believes it's a diabolical plot or, or I believe it is. I think the solution, that's where we should be going. Dig up Dwight Eisenhower, bring back his tax code. Help working families put food on the table and a roof over their heads. Seems sane and rational to me. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, Rick at the RickSmithShow.com. Got a lot more to get to right back after this. Stick around. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1950. That was the day the Red Scare took its toll on the U.S. labor movement. The Congress of Industrial Organizations expelled the International Union of Mine, Mill, and Smelter Workers for their alleged communist ties. Although small in numbers, communist organizers had played an important role in building the large industrial unions that were the core of the CIO. During the CIO's 1949 convention, this anti-communist hysteria was on full display. There, the CIO delegates decided to bar any individual with communist affiliations from serving as union officers. Their panic did not stop there, as the CIO leadership also voted to revolt the charters of unions they deemed too closely aligned with the communists. 
Immediately, the convention threw out the United Electrical, Radio, and Machine Workers. During the 1950s, more unions were caught up in the purge, including the International Union of Longshoremen and Warehousemen. In all, the anti-communist frenzy saw 11 unions ousted from the House of Labor. According to a report to Congress by the Department of Labor, the cause of these expulsions was that the union's, quote, espousal of Soviet Russia became increasingly distasteful to the CIO leadership and rank-and-file membership. Cold War fear-mongering had effectively isolated isolated the most left-leaning unions in the country. The impact on the labor movement was long-lasting. After the purge, unions took a much more moderate stance on things like civil rights. This hampered their organizing efforts in the South. To this day, there is less union representation in Southern states. It also pushed the CIO closer to the Democratic Party and paved the way for the CIO's reunification with the more politically moderate American Federation of Labor. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Check out our website, thericksmithshow.com. Questions, comments, something in your mind. Email me, Rick, at thericksmithshow.com. So, Michigan. I'm looking at you, Michigan. And this is this is part of the solution. This is how we move the country forward. By running on things, how we're going to make people's lives better. Get away from the culture war nonsense. Get away, get away from fighting over nonsense and fight for things that are going to make people's lives better. And I look to Michigan. Uh, Michigan in the last election achieved the trifecta. They got the governor's mansion, they got uh, the House and the Senate, and they immediately went to work. They immediately went to work doing things going to make working people's lives better in that state. And I think that's going to pay dividends in November uh, when people go, hey, you know, do, who do we want? Do we want the crazy guy who wants, uh, you know, vengeance and, and retribution? Or do we want the, the party that's actually doing something to help working people? And for those who don't know, Michigan, almost on day one, set out on the agenda to, uh, to, to, to restore workers' rights. They became the first state in nearly 60 years to abandon their no rights at work uh, push and, and give and make Michigan a, a right to bargain state. Uh, that is a huge thing. And Virginia, I was calling for you to do this for, for years when you had power. This is what Democrats have to learn from. Learn this lesson. You got to do stuff. They've expanded abortion access for women. Uh, they've expanded the uh, and protected folks in the LGBT community. They've done some stuff on education. They've done things to make lives better. Uh, they've restored prevailing wage. That's a huge thing going to make wages better for working people. And you know how you know how it's going to be better when someone like Dick DeVos, billionaire Betsy DeVos, billionaire Betsy's husband, Dick, uh, when he comes out and says, well, um, uh, the workers are going to pay the price for this. Uh, uh, this is bad uh, because, you know, you know, doing away with right to work laws is bad for workers. No, it's not. It actually gives workers the ability to fight for better wages, hours, conditions. Now, his argument is, look, well, you know, you know workers haven't been joining unions. Their, their numbers are plummeting. Let's not forget it's the Republican Party who is hell-bent on destroying labor. And as we talk right now, in Iowa, the Republican legislature there is doing their full hearty best to go and destroy what they can in, in uh, Iowa in a right-to-work state, make it even worse. Because it, it's never going to end. It's not going to end, folks. Republicans hate working people. Look at what they do. So when you get the billionaire coming out and saying, you know, this union thing, this union thing's bad for workers. Who are you going to believe? You know, I go back to something my grandfather always said. If a rich guy is going to take a buck out of his pocket to tell you you don't need something, you better spend two to get it. Because Dick DeVos and, and billionaire Betsy, they didn't get to have all that money by being stupid. They understand return on investment. They invest in things they know are going to come back to them in multiples. So when someone like Dick DeVos says this is a bad idea, I'm like, I got to tell you, I think, I think it's probably going to move us in the right direction. I think it's a good thing. But here's the, here's the, the bottom line in all this. We're one election, one election, one election away from that all being gone. Donald Trump has said 
He's all about retribution. He's all about payback. He's going to go after those federal workers. He's going to put people in their place. And the reality is, is, well, that's going to be you. It's going to be me. It's going to be us. Because, well, they don't know no bounds. There is no depth too deep for them to go after. So I got to tell you, uh, for us moving forward, Democrats, if you're listening, stop fighting over the culture war stuff. Talk about how you're going to make my life better, how you're going to make working people's lives better. Be like Michigan. There's an idea. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. If you miss any portion of the program, make sure you grab the podcast, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You'll find ours. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick Rick at rick at thericksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.